BitGardener's web seminar. Today we'll be taking a deep dive into dispersion and the pre-dispersion process. My name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here at BitGardener and uh, I'll be moderating uh, today's discussion. Um, we have uh, Andy Stumer, our business line manager for dispersion. He'll be presenting today. We are also recording this, so immediately following the presentation, you'll receive this uh, link in your inbox. Um, feel free to take a look at it, share it with colleagues, um, date night, whatever you need to do. That's good. Um, also, uh, we should have some time for some questions, so please leave any questions you have in the chat box located in the bottom right-hand corner, and uh, uh, we'll get to them immediately following the presentation. So with that, let me turn it over to Andy and uh, here we go. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, John. Uh, really appreciate everybody. The uh, dispersion and deep dive, and this is the first part. And what we're going to do is we're going to discuss actually the uh, pre-dispersion process. And uh, just to give you a quick overview, the uh, first two introductions, and then uh, just an overview of who is VMA and how do they relate to BIC. And then we dive into the dispersion process. And then uh, we cover some different lab as well as production equipment, talk about the QC capabilities and also the lab capabilities that we offer in Germany as well as in Wallingford, Connecticut. So the company has been founded in 1972 in Germany, uh, you see this nice couple on top right there. They have um, founded the company. Mr. Herman Getzman uh, used to actually be a co-owner of Anton Parr. And then he uh, uh, bought out, uh, sold out, and he, uh, he used the proceeds to found, found DMA Getzman. Um, the company and BIC uh, have gone back many years. And since 1988, we've had a strategic relationship. Canada. Uh, the company is still in family hands. Today it's run by the two sons, uh, Christian and Martin. Uh, the company is located outside of Cologne in Germany, about 30 miles east. Uh, they have over 100 employees, uh, about eight people uh, just dedicated for the design in the design department to develop the equipment. Uh, and VMA is known to make really high quality dissolvers, bead mills, uh, basket mills, anything for upscale all the way up to uh, right there on the bottom you can see the first dispermat actually was built in 1973 and one of my very first meetings that i had when i started working for big about 15 years ago uh, was with the company uh in west virginia and they are still running we're still running back then the original dispermats uh, that they had purchased that were brought in from Germany back then before Big even was a distributor. And today they are still running on the original motors. So this is quite unbelievable. The only thing box that you can see right there. Uh, so that speaks uh, for the technology. So here is just a quick uh, uh, overview of the company. Uh, VMA is right there and the middle building that you can see the larger one that's actually a new addition and that was finished last year. Uh, one good thing about the company is that about 40% of all the equipment that they manufacture is custom. So there's a lot of different requirements for people, especially with vacuum systems and so forth. Needs and they can accommodate those as well. Uh, and then we have um, a really nice uh, dispersion lab. I'll show you some slides later on in Wallingford um, up in Connecticut with our sister company, the big additives group. And that allows us to leverage those synergies and help customers just improve uh, their formulations and, and get better dispersion results. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of uh, what arenas are we uh, playing in without this format so obviously there's the different pig pigments inorganic pigments and then these functional as well as uh, special effect pigments which are a little bit more sensitive because we don't want to destroy those uh, metallics uh, and the idea is why we're dispersing is just to get a better gloss uh, reading 
uh, improve transparency as well as color, and then um, tinctorial strength or cleanliness of shader, some of the other attributes that are being improved uh, by having a better product or, or dispersion. So obviously we're dispersing. Uh, the idea is also to break these particles up, these pigment particles. They are clusters of um, these pigment primary particles uh, and these agglomerates actually, ideally in the pre-dispersion process, we wanna break up these agglomerates and turn them into aggregates. And the, the reason these particles are, are being held together is these invisible forces. They're like magnetic forces. They're called Van der Waal forces. And they make these primary particles uh, attract to each other and create these large uh, what we want to break up with in the dispersion process. And if we want to do the fine grinding or milling, which is the second part of this uh, uh, presentation, that's when we would uh, actually break up these aggregates and turn them into primary particle size. But for that, we don't use cow's blades. We use uh, milling disks and media. Um, so then, obviously, we want to improve our color, the gloss, uh, or the overall appearance will be improved by having a better dispersion. Uh, we can save money by having better pigment efficiency, raw material cost that way. And we also have better product consistency from lot to lot by having a more consistent dispersion. And obviously that uh, means our formulation is, is, is greatly improved. And we also would, would have a consistent particle size distribution if it's done right. And that when we want to go from the lab all the way up to manufacturing or, or pilot, it would allow us to have better upscale results. And for that, we also have really good technology uh, that allows us to get there, um, create get it from the lab and then upscale. So some of the problems that uh, people will encounter when they don't have uh, good dis dispersing of their pigments is obviously we have chain shifting color or poor stability of our color. Uh, pigments flocculate uh, back, uh, sagging, leveling, or, or settling uh, some of these uh, major issues. Uh, gloss is something that also suffers. Uh, haze is not on there, but that would also be one. Separation is another issue uh, that can occur with having an improperly dispersed product. So here are the uh, critical elements uh, to have uh, when we uh, want to get a good pigment dispersion, so stability. Uh, so pigments will require strong color fastness to uh, be more stable in, 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 in a weathered environment. So, you know, if, if we have a good dispersion and, and the right formulation, then uh, we'll have a more stable product in, uh, in the, on the weather. Uh, bright good dispersion will give us definitely the best possible color. Uh, pigment size. So. Uh, the rule there is, is that the smaller the pigment particles provide, therefore we have better uh, uh, improved transparency, uh, improved color, as well as, again, we can save money by using less pigment uh, in our formulation. And then lastly, viscosity uh, is really important uh, because the lower the viscosity uh, usually is, is better in my dispersion process for an improved particle size distribution. So it's a lot more difficult when I have very pasty, uh, you know, formulations uh, that makes it a lot more challenging to do the proper dispersion. But also I want to say one thing is that at lower viscosity is not always uh, the best, especially when you go into milling, because if my viscosity is very low, then it's a little bit more difficult to put in a lot of energy into my mill base. And when we want it, disperse or mill down our product. We want to be able to um, put in a lot of energy into the product. Uh, to so ideally, uh, very good results are achieved with, let's say, 1,000 center poise up to about 10,000 center poise. In that range, this is a really good sweet spot. Uh, but of course, there is applications with much higher or lower uh, viscosity levels and, 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 and these will also be able to be processed 
but uh, there is the sweet spot between one and 10,000. 10, uh, so it's really important to remember when we are dispersing, we're really just trying and we don't really want to destroy our particles. That's not the goal of the uh, exercise. And in the pre-dispersion process, um, we just take our agglomerates and we turn them into aggregates. And then when the secondary dispersion process, which we call the fine grinding, is when we take these aggregates and we turn them into the primary particle size. And for that step, you do need to do the media milling. Um, and the shear forces are really the critical element here that's responsible for the separation of our particles. Uh, and the additives at the end uh, are, are what will keep the particles in a suspended state. So the big additives team could help you uh, pick the right additives for, for that application. So it's just a, a, a slide showing just a different uh, particle size of different pigments. And then I really enjoy this slide because it shows us the different uh, elements. So we have these larger clusters, which are we of pigment particles. And the idea is in my pre-dispersion process, I want to break up these binding forces and turn them into aggregates. So from going from here to the aggregates is where I'm uh, using my Kyle's blade and my dissolver. And from here, from the aggregates down to the primary particle size, that's where I would need to do the media milling. Uh, because I don't have enough shear forces uh, that, that I can apply with just the cow's blade. So we really need to use media to go from aggregates to the primary particle size. And we want to obviously stabilize them uh, with the right additives. So this is a great slide as well. So you can see in the beginning we do wetting. And uh, we use the cow split for the pre-dispersion. And then when we go down to the primary particle size, we actually move over to uh, a bead mill, uh, or either horizontal or vertical bead mill. Uh, and that allows us then to do the grinding and then uh, create, uh, turn them into primary particles and then at the end stabilize them so that they stay in a... In a um. So here is a good slide that just kind of shows you at what point you should move over from a dissolver and start the milling process. So the rule of thumb is when I start with very large particles, uh, I use a dissolver and then down to about 10 microns of particle size. That's kind of the limit. Usually what I've seen is between 10 and 20 microns. That's kind of like the threshold. But at anything less than 10, I really need And there I can go down depending on what kind of screen or dynamic gap that I use or what type of milling system that I want to use. I can go down to all the way very uh, low sub 100 nanometers is not a problem. Uh, would take a long time depending on the, on the material you're trying to mill, but therefore, you really need to use media to really get you down to that very small uh, particle size. So this, this slide really shows it well. So we have the dispersion process is these two parts. So we got the pre-dispersion uh, where it's really critical to look at the tip speed, which is the peripheral speed, the speed of your blade. Uh, and you should be there between 18 to 25 meters per second. That's the optimum dispersion window. Anything else, if you put too much energy in, uh, you, I'm going to show you some slides. You're not going to be properly dispersing because you just have too much energy. And if you don't have enough, it's just going to take a very long time. And we have different models there, the uh, SCLC, CVC, and different uh, for different sizes uh, and also with different kind, kind of uh, control capabilities and, 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 and data uh, readout capabilities. And then for the fine dispersion process or the milling, uh, there is a difference between the vertical mills, basket mills, or horizontal mills. So the vertical bead mills are also called pot mills. And then we have also some 
good solutions. They're like an air pressure system, basket mills, TML, and then on the horizontal mill, we have our lab mills, DSL or the RS series for production. So when we look at predispersing, it's really important to pick the right blade diameter. Uh, so usually about one third. And uh, so this is a really good slide showing you kind of the sweet spots. So on the uh, left right there, you can see the diameter of your, of your disc and the container size right on the bottom there. And then all of them, but you can use a variety of plates for certain container sizes, depending on your viscosity and how much energy you're putting in. You know, is your product foaming? What are some of the other criterias? But usually you want to start with about uh, a third to one half and then work your way up. Um, and then uh, depending on your, your product, you should be easily able to identify the uh, right blade. Uh, this is a good uh, formula right there, just trying to calculate your tips meters per second. So the uh, tape speed or peripheral velocity is calculated by the diameter uh, by the pi times the dissolver disk diameter and then multiply that by the RPMs uh, of, of, of your machine, what speed settings you have. And if you want to calculate meters per second, then you divide the whole thing by 60 and the uh, dissolver disk diameter in meters. So if it's uh, 50 millimeters, it's 0 0.05. Uh, times the RPM time give you uh, meters per second. The higher end uh, machines like our AE series or the vacuum systems, the VL, they have what's called C technology and they will actually display the tape speed on the uh, control board. So then you don't have to calculate it. That's really helpful. That's also important, uh, one of the important parameters, tip speed when I upscale, uh, because that should always stay the same, that the tip speed is identical from my lab to pilot to production. Critical elements or variables that needs to be the same for having good upscale results. So the second really important clue is, a cue is the, we call it the visual cue, is the donut effect. And the donut effect is called that because when you look inside of your vessel where you're dispersing your predispersing your product, if you optimize all the right parameters, amount of energy you're putting in, tape speed, viscosity is correct of your material, you should be able to really see this beautifully formed your vessel during the, during the dispersion process. And that is kind of like the first thing that I'm looking at when I'm starting to uh, disperse my material. What's it look like when I'm doing it? And ideally, when I see a donut, then I know uh, I'm optimizing everything. And that's what I want to want to see. Um, if you have now products that are really viscous, like pasty, that's a much more difficult thing to get. Doesn't mean you're not dispersing properly. It just means that your viscosity is very high and therefore you're not seeing really a good donut. So the donut really shows up between 10. I'm seeing a really, really good donut. Um, if it's too low, the viscosity, then it's also more difficult to get a donut because it would collapse very quickly. That doesn't mean that you're not dispersing properly. It just means that the viscosity is uh, kind of low to get the optimum donut. So what happens there is, is basically when I look at my Carl's blade, all my shear forces and the separation of my particles, that takes place right at the edges of my blade. So that's where the forces uh, of my high tip speed, that's what's causing the bre breaking up of these uh, binding Van der Waals forces. And that's what's causing uh, my, my agglomerates to basically turn into aggregates if I optimize uh, the process. So in this picture, you can see a nicely uh, shaped donut. Uh, we're running with 21 meters per second and we're putting in about 850 watts of energy. So you can already see it's a really good looking donut. So I know uh, we should have how long 
between 15 minutes to 30 minutes uh, usually should be enough to properly predisperse your product before you, you start the milling. Um, in this case here, uh, you can see the splattering. We are not getting a very well-formed donut. Our viscosity, everything is still the same, except now we didn't put in the right amount of energy. Uh, and that is causing us not to properly disperse our material. So when you do a grind check, you will probably won't see much change from putting in enough shear forces to really break up uh, the binding forces. So in this case, we need to add, put in more energy. Uh, in this case, we have no donut and we have put in way too much energy. So we're still running at 21 meters per second, but it's just not um, efficient uh, in the, because we, is, we, have, we have too much energy. Therefore, my pigment particles just get thrown around in there and don't really have time to get uh, sheared enough. By so here's just a, uh, a slide about uh, the dispersion re result related to mechanical power. Two, two high times uh, the uh, shaft speed and the torque uh, that will uh, give you the dispersion result related to your uh, mechanical power. Okay. So in order for us to optimize the dispersion result, we are obviously looking at the right duration of a dispersion. Again, rule of... Uh, ideally, I would like to see a donut effect, tape speed 18 to 25 meters per second, uh, the geometry of my blade, the design of my blade, and also the size of my blade. Uh, and then obviously the right choice of impeller disc or blade. So there's many different ones on the market. And depending on the type of product, one some may work better for you than others. Uh, the volume. So we recommend usually that if you uh, have about a 50% mill base, you're good to go. Okay. Uh, but you don't want to have, let's say in the lab, a one liter container and you fill it up to the brim, it's going to spill everywhere, uh, especially when, when you start putting in some energy. So try to stay in the 50 to 70% range, and that, that should be uh, a really good um, number uh, for filling the container. Uh, pigment filler concentration, obviously. Uh, we want to be as, co you know, the temperature, also depending on the material, we want to be as, as low as possible because but the uh, or putting in a lot of energy. With the cow's blade, uh, the energy that we are putting in is not as high as when I'm milling. When we are media milling, we really need to look at um, cooling systems. And there we recommend to use a double wall container uh, and then uh, with jackets and then basically chill it down so that the uh, temperature doesn't go up. I've seen cases where basically um, especially with solvent products, it goes over ADC very easily. All the solvents evaporate and it's not cooling properly. So cooling is important. And then again, uh, the type of additives that you choose will help you improve your wetting, uh, your dispersing results. And then obviously after the fact that they don't flock it back together. And then we want to then go to a bead mill if uh, we uh, try to do the fine grinding or go down to very small particles below 10, 10 microns. So the difference uh, between the dissolver step uh, or pre grinding is on my dissolver, I have some more than limited amount of energy that I can put in just because I'm dealing with the cow spit alone. So that also means limited shear force and it's really only there to deagglomerate uh, and not turn the aggregates into primary particles. Uh, it is an important step. It's a critical step before any, uh, for any dispersion before I start milling. So a lot of uh, customers sometimes, they are not very familiar, they're new to the dispersing and milling world. They would uh, sometimes think that they can forgo milling or bead milling. And the problem there is if you use, let's say, a horizontal mill or a basket mill with a screen, 
and your particles are too big, then that would clog your screen or your dynamic gap, depending on the setup that you have. And then you wouldn't have good flow of your product. So it's really important that you predisperse, put the particles in the right, right range, and then select the right media. And we would cover that in the second part of this presentation another time uh, where we talk about the media selection and the size of media and so on. It is a critical uh, step for, uh, for uh, any milling to do that predispersion properly. Uh, and then obviously we can't get the perfect color if we're just using a dissolver because our color strength will be limited. Also our gloss <clears throat> as well will, will suffer as a result. Um, when I'm bead milling, <clears throat> excuse me, I can put in more energy, uh, much more energy. Therefore, also I have to keep in mind that I need really good cooling there. Um, to uh, nanometers, so this is where we turn the aggregates into primary particle size. And uh, at that point, I really see a good improvement of my dispersion by improving these uh, important characteristics such as the color, you know, a better transparency, uh, particle size distribution, and of course, my particle size will be much smaller uh, when I use media mills uh, to, to break down these primary part of the uh, ag aggregates. <clears throat> so, what we use for a, a predispersion step uh, is a laboratory dissolver. So, we this is just an example of our flagship unit. This is called the AE. Uh, ideally, what you want to look at uh, is that you obviously have variable speed that they go up to, depending on the product volume, some of them can go up to 20,000 RPMs. So it really depends. What's really important there is what is my uh, batch size, and the smaller my batch, the higher the RPMs that I need because my blade diameter will be smaller, and I need to be between 18 to 25 meters per second where I'm having very little mill base, 50 mils, uh, you know, 100 mils, I really need the high RPM range because the blade diameter will be very small because my container is very small. And therefore, these small lab units have much higher RPM ranges than, for example, a pilot scale or manufacturing scale unit where the blade diameter is much bigger and therefore I don't need these high RPMs to get that tip speed. Um, you ideally would want a disperser that allows you also to turn it into or use it for different uh, great things about the dispermat line uh, is the design philosophy from uh, Mr. Getzman. He felt that he wanted to develop a, a product that is also universally usable for also not only your dispersing needs, but also your milling needs. So there is different attachments that can go right onto this unit right here. So you can turn a dissolver and this can turn into a basket mill or a vertical bead mill. Uh, on top, you see this clamping right there. That is actually a uh, quick change clamping ring. I can remove the cowl's blade or shaft assembly and pop, pop on a basket mill or a bead mill or a rotor stator even uh, if I want to. I can also purchase a vacuum system or different other attachments that would fit right onto this machine. Uh, for the high-end models, ideally what you would like to see is software uh, that allows you to really upscale from a laboratory to a manufacturing environment. So all the critical upscale parameters will be on the display and will also be able to be transferred in a database uh, on the higher-end models. So we have obviously uh, these different tools that we can incorporate with, by, with the dissolver. So we can use them as a homogenizer. So therefore we can add a propeller or a butterfly tool. They exist for these dispersers. I can turn them into uh, an emulsifier by using a rotor stator, which is an attachment, or just as a standard disperser uh, with the dis diff different kinds add a milling disc or a basket mill, they would all, all these different components would fit onto the same <coughs> disperser. So there's a great picture that just shows you. I have one uh, dispermat 
and then all these different attachments that you can purchase to go right onto the machine. And now you turn one machine into a basket mill or a bead mill or a rotor stator or a vacuum system, or you could also purchase a wall scraper system <clears throat> for really viscous materials, or you want to get make sure that all your wall and gets pushed into the center of your container for proper dispersion person, then uh, the wall scraping system ASC uh, it will help you do that. Uh, then uh, just a small, uh, very la crude laboratory type dissolver, it's called the LC. So economy line, not a lot of bells and whistles, great to use uh, for small volume, uh, just a speed display right here, and you have a timer function, that's it. Um, the also uh, the downside is, I have to say, and you have also that goes for competitive units, You ideally you would want to have an electronic lift where that motor goes up and down electronically. On the LC line, you have to do it manually. You see that uh, uh, crank right there? You you can open and loose it, loosen it and then lever, and then you basically tighten it uh, if you want to place it in position. Let's say you want to oscillate, uh, you know, the cow split in your container. Manually move it up and down. So that's really not that great. Not yeah, great. exactly. So for that, we have the CV line. And that's kind of like one step up where you now have a little bit more features. But the important feature is that up and down button right there. Um, and then on the LC line, a CV line, you also have a temperature readout in addition to a timer function, but it also would give you a torque reading, which is an indirect measurement of viscosity. And uh, we use so if you ever used to this permit, you know what they sound like. You don't need ear protection. Um, they are also vibration free, pretty much. You could put a quarter up here, and it won't bounce off even at high RPMs. Um, they are also equipped with the uh, safety features, and that's also very important uh, when you want to get, uh, when you look at lab equipment. The disperser here, the CV line, has a sensor back here. So with that uh, wheel, you tighten the container clamp. Pressure. And it ensures that it's centered, but that always exercises and exerts enough pressure to ensure that the container doesn't wiggle around. If that happens, it will give you a, an error message here, safe fail message, and then you would have to tighten it to make sure it's properly locked in. That will also allow the blade to be perfectly centered and not have your blade brush the container wall. I mean, imagine if you're running this at 20,000 RPMs and you're running a solvent product, the last thing you want is that metal blade hitting a metal uh, in a solvent environment. That would not be uh, a good thing. Um, we also have the secondary safety feature, which is very important. You see a magnetic slider right there, and that allows you to set a threshold uh, in your container for basically uh, shutting off the machine if somebody were to lift the blade above the threshold. And we have a threshold for the bottom, which is adjusted on the backside with the slider. And we have a top one, which is this one right here. And that basically the unit uh, in that in within these two thresholds, we call them H1 and H2. And then basically uh, protect the operator from a spinning blade outside of the container. You won't have product flying around or it won't touch the bottom of your container. Again, if you're doing solvents, that's not good, um, metal on metal. Um, in this case, you can see the double wall container for cooling. You have the jackets right there, so it's really nice uh, setup. The, uh, that, that shaft protection pipe that uh, is adjusted, there is a little tension. tension screw right there, and that allows you to uh, slide that protection pipe up and down to ensure really that there is no moving or rotating parts uh, outside of the container uh, as you're doing your, your dispersing. 
So then uh, the next model up, this is a great model for customers that want to predisperse, also maybe mill. Uh, the, the unit can go all the way up to pilot in the same product family. Uh, and on this model here, it's the same as the CV3, except larger. And you don't have the magnetic slider anymore. Now you can set the H1 threshold and H2 electronically on the display right here. So it's actually right up here. It's H1 and H2. And basically that allows you to set these two points uh, electronically. Otherwise, it's the same thing. I'll show you your speed, your torque reading, temp about the electric motor lift also for uh, moving the uh, motor up and down. And the same safety features. Also, all of our diplomats, including the smallest one I showed you, the LC, I go back, all the way CV, CN, they all have that modular feature that I explained earlier that you want is where you can convert these dispersers into different milling or rotor stator systems or vacuum systems. So they all have that uh, modularity. And then we come uh, larger CN, like looking at a uh, pilot scale and more, more safety. This one comes already with an integrated cover, depending on the container size, to ensure that there is nobody uh, that can reach into the uh, machine while it's running. Uh, and then this is our premium line. Basically, we called it the AE, which comes with that C technology that allows you to port all the data over to a computer. It has the ability to do uh, uh, net power calibration. You want to, you know, if you look at torque values or power input values and upscale, that you really only want to show the energy that the machine is using to disperse the product, but not the energy level that it's used to operate itself. Because when you turn on the machine and it's running with that product, it's already consuming power. And by doing a net power calibration, I can factor out that self-use energy and only show what is used to disperse the product. Uh, I can program cutout values or cutoff values. So if you have a very sensitive product, certain temperature, then you can program and say if it reaches, let's say, you know, 50 C or 80 C or Fahrenheit, you can change it, then it automatically either runs at a different speed or shuts off altogether. So that's a really good feature. And you can also program that for your speed as well as for your energy input, depending on how you run it. Because with the machine, I have the ability with the C technology to also run it as what's called constant power. And instead of just running at a certain speed setting, I can dial let's say 800 watts of energy. And then the machine will automatically adjust the speed depending on the viscosity change of your product and uh, depending on if the viscosity goes up, that means if I'm maintaining the 850 watts of energy, my speed will decrease. Uh, if my viscosity goes down and I'm maintaining the same amount of energy, then my speed will increase. So that's... Uh, what we call a constant power. Uh, that also allows you to basically calculate uh, for what it will cost you to manufacture product because you know exactly how much energy you're using to disperse a certain amount of product in a certain amount of time. Um, everything can be sent over to a, a computer uh, and then you can see the entire dispersing process in real time. And there is also uh, a a, a graphical interface so you can see each of these indices tape speed torque energy input uh, temperature and time uh, in a trend line so you could then see if there is a peak immediately if there is a problem with the dispersion or milling process uh, and then again we have larger aes for pilot i'm going to go through all the different features there but let us know if you're interested in pilots so we can help you there or, or large scale manufacturing even uh, SC, this is our large uh, production dissolver. We can go up to 2000 liters, uh, same kind of idea. And with that, I can also uh, incorporate the quick change system 
So if I want to do milling as well, I can do mill uh, just by adding a basket mill. And for that, we have the quick change system that allows you to very quickly move from a dissolver to a basket mill. Uh, we also offer them with vacuum capabilities. Uh, that has the advantage of if you are dispersing material and you have an issue with foaming and then you can't transfer the product uh, fast enough from one vessel to another. So by using vacuum, I can eliminate all the foam and then I have a much better transfer efficiency than without vacuum. So come in really handy. Uh, we have the ability to add nitrogen for certain applications where uh, it's different types of slurries where people don't want, uh, customers don't want any moisture in there. So we could purge nitrogen and basically run it like a wet process, but it's actually dry because nitrogen is liquid gas. Uh, so then uh, you can see right there, these are the different control panel options so that on the, on the left there is our new C technology. And on the right, this is just a standard for production. It's kind of a kind of interface. And then you have the ability to program your own if you want to with your own control panel. And then this here shows you uh, the software. It's actually getting updated right now. So this is still the older screen uh, from the Windows software. Uh, where you can basically program uh, and, uh, on the C technology, you give your different products a name, and then here you can see all the different va values. Uh, if I'm, I'm putting in my diameter of my blade, uh, the type of container I'm using, size, uh, the H1, H2, the threshold settings, um, where the actual blade is located at any given moment in the container, the height, uh, my timer function, and then here my cutoff values. And then over here, and I can see this on the computer, uh, all the different values uh, that uh, are important in my process. Okay. And then this is just uh, how to set that. Takes about 30 seconds. And then you have, uh, then your unit would be calibrated to just show you the actual energy that it's using to operate uh, itself without any material, uh, or just a material. And that's kind of like what the current Windows 7 looks like. And that's gonna, we're actually working on an update there. It's called Windows 10. It's a much changed interface, but basically, from a computer so which is nice and if I'm not in the lab all the time let's say I'm milling for six hours or dispersing not so much but with milling I don't want to be standing in front of my mill I can see everything what's going on on my computer and on the new wind this will allow us to look at the data on a mobile device which is going to come in really handy it sends us messages to our phone if the dispersion process is complete or the temperature was out of range or anything else so it's really helpful. So then uh, lastly, we have and then this is our Wallingford lab where we have additional equipment. There's some updated equipment in there now. So we have horizontal mills, we have uh, standard dissolvers. So back there you can see CV3 and this is the uh, AE6. That's also been updated now. So we have two A6s and over here you can see we have an, an SL mill uh, SL25, which is SL12, actually, this one here. It's a, a vertical bead mill, and we have the new AE in there as well with the new seat control panel. So these are all the lab. So Wallingford Lab is really great because it ties in our big additives folks. Uh, they are always uh, available to give recommendations on the, uh, you know, on formulation questions and help the customer approve uh, products. Uh, we can show you the, how the equipment works with your with your uh, material. We can scale up, um, and then then uh, it's a, like a showroom to show customers what different attachments we have and how to use them. And then 
membership, we could also offer this as a training location. If you have a larger group and want to come in, or even a seminar location to do a deep dive into the dispersing and milling on location and using the equipment. So uh, that's it from my end. I really appreciate uh, everybody on there, and I turn it back to John. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Good, good stuff as always. Um, if anyone has any questions or, or comments or any challenges they're they're facing in their own facilities, um, please jot that down in the chat um, box in the bottom right hand corner, and uh, we'll get to them. Um, let's see. Yes, Sean. Um, yep, you'll get a copy of the presentation. Um, a, a link to the recording will be sent out immediately following. Uh, uh, this presentation just a little bit so you'll, you'll get that and um, feel free to you know reply back if you guys need anything or if you need to contact any of our applications team members or andy directly you can reply to any of the marketing emails you get um that'll come to either me or my colleague and, and we'll get those to the right people um you know andy back uh to the dispersion equipment you know yeah, I've heard you go through this several times before, and it, it still always amazes me the um, flexibility and uh, you know of the system that you can start off with a pilot production and and then you know grow from there. Right. So the good thing is is that everything is really seamless. So all of our systems, whether you go with a small laboratory dissolver uh, and want to upscale to pilot or even manufacturing, so it's very cool. And, and, and when we can help you there. So that's nice. And especially with the C technology, where you have all these really critical dispersing parameters that you want to use when you upscale. So that's great. Um, but even with the other units like the CN, where you don't have the database capability or showing you the tape speed on the display, you can still calculate these values. But we have really good up, upscale results, especially with our basket mills from a TML1. Uh, and then you want to go up to a, a, a product or to large TML TML pilot or even manufacturing. So they scale really, really well. Awesome. Awesome. Um, another question here um, from Ann. Is, uh, is the material base you're dispersing um, into hydroscopic, what recommendations do you have for dispersing, either equipment or additives? So you are based, I'm sorry. L let me read that again. If the material base you are dispersing into is hydroponic, hydroscopic, I'm sorry, hydroscopic, okay. what recommendations do you have for dispersing either equipment or additives? Right. So if, if it's really sensitive that way, so we offer like a VL system that allows you to have a vessel that's contained. Uh, you could actually turn a, a, use a vac vacuum there also to make sure that there is no moisture coming in or anything else. And then basically it's in a self-contained environment. Okay, great. And did that answer your question? You can just throw a chat here. Um, also, Andy, are there frequent questions that you get for cu from customers um, kind of you know, either currently doing dispersion work or um, looking to get into it? Um, yeah, so we do. And then one of the, I got one yesterday. So a customer, for example, had purchased a dispromat from us 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and he wants to use the dispromat to do some type of milling. So the great thing is, is that uh, while he didn't have the quick change system when he bought it 10 years ago, so he bought, it actually was a CN model. And he just had the solver. Uh, but he heard from a colleague that he could potentially do milling with this piece of equipment. So he contacted us. And, and basically what he, he did was he purchased a DL shaft, which is an adapter flange that goes right onto the uh, instrument that he has. And that has the quick change system, the connector piece. And that now allows him to go very quickly from a dissolver over to a basket mill or a bead mill or even a rotor stator. So it's a very easy way of making that change. And he was really surprised how quickly uh, he could. Uh, so, awesome. yeah. But that doesn't mean because you have an older piece of equipment that that's not going to be 
but that, that can't be configured to a mill. So if you are looking to do that, what we would like to see is a, uh, a picture of the setup that you currently have. And also on the side of the motor, there is a flange that has the make and model of the year and also a serial number. And that will help us identify what type of attachments, uh, what's, uh, what the L shaft you would need to. to okay. Great, thank you. Um, and an answering your question to um, any additive recommendations, um, we're you know as part of the presentation when we download the um, the attendees list, we also download the questions. Um, we can get pass that question along to our um, BIC additives group, and they they'll be able to help you out. Um, so if for some reason you don't hear from them in the next week, um, feel free to reply back to us, and we'll light a fire for you. Um, Next question from John here. Um, does BIC offer any sonication-based dispersion equipment for nanoparticle-based materials? No, we don't. Um, we, we, we strictly do bead milling applications. Okay. But you can't go down to sub 50 nanometers with our cell mill. We have a special nano kit. Um, this uh, sonification works well. There's some drawbacks to it, especially when you upscale. They are brutally loud, uh, very expensive, but the noise level is just really, really high. And uh, in a lot of applications, it's just not doable. So for that, I mean, a big mill is more functional for that. Okay. So maybe, you know, John, we'll pass that question along. Andy will get that later too. Um, perhaps you guys can have a conversation, you know, more about your application and if, um, you know, a bead mill, um, like Andy just mentioned, would, would work for you. Um, other questions out there, please log them in the, the chat function. Um, Andy, how, how large can we go up to? You mentioned that the smaller side just a minute ago. Um, yeah, up to 2,000 liters. Okay. I have a custom applications where 2,500 liters is doable. So it, it depends, but we have a really wide range. Okay, good, good, good. Um, other um, unique challenges that, that we offer, um, I know the explosion proof, that's, that's a key function if that's something that's needed in, in your facility. Um, I know we do offer that. Yeah, like uh, the, the wall scraping option is great, you know, especially if customers have really viscous material, like more people. Well, the ability to uh, get a vacuum system. I you know we talked a little bit about foaming. That can be a challenge. So by having, uh, you know, the ability to remove air and not have that problem, that's great. Um, and also just the different milling attachments that we offer, you know. It's, it's, it's really nice to have a base machine that is very flexible and future-proof, really. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And even can grow into production. Um, right. Another question here from John. Uh, can you manage the exothermic reaction of friction based dispersing with a fully jacketed double wall mixing container and recirculating coolant? Yes, you can. You have to just design the vessel. So, but the depending on on the on the with, we work with Julabo and they develop special cooling systems. So depending on the need for cooling, we can look at that and then also the vessel design. Good deal, good deal. Well, um, with that, I think we'll, we'll wrap up here. Like I said, you'll, you'll get a copy of the presentation in your inbox. Um, feel free to take a look at it, share it with colleagues, um, you know, bring it home for date night. I know our, my colleague, Sherry, um, she likes that. Um, so, Take a look also for future invites for web seminars um, that we offer, either this full presentation set or also in office hours, which is an abbreviated presentation with an extended uh, dialogue Q&A discussion. Um, so thank you, Andy, for um, your expertise, your knowledge, your experience. Um, thank you everyone for attending and uh, we look forward to seeing you on future big web seminars. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Appreciate the attendance.
How do I get off? 